few years ago, about this time of the academic year, some of you may remember the Minneapolis Tribune did uh, that survey that we've mentioned before of graduating students, and uh, they asked them uh, why they were looking for certain jobs and what they were looking for in certain jobs. And then, you remember, the reporter kind of categorized them under three headings. And he said that everybody seemed to be concerned with one of three motives in the job they were heading for. And either it was profit, it was the profit motive that was governing them, or it was the power, the power motive, the opportunity to exercise power, or it was the success motive. It was the desire for success. And you remember last Sunday, we kind of agreed that we in the 20th century seem to be dominated by those motives. We seem to be so dominated by them that at times you could almost describe us as a driven people. We seem, you know, to be driven by profit, power, success. We seem hardly to be free people who can paint because we enjoy painting, who can practice medicine because we really do enjoy dealing with the body and dealing in a healing and an analytical and intelligent way with it. But we seem, in spite of many of the abilities that we have, to be rather driven by these motives, rather than guided even so much by our abilities. It seems some of us start off being guided by our abilities, don't we? And then as we try to mesh them in with society, somehow the thing begins to become twisted, and we end up in the drive for profit or power or success. In a way, loved ones, it's reasonable, you know, that we should be. When you think of our situation, when you think that here we are on a spherical piece of matter spinning through space at a thousand miles an hour with no uh, visible means of support and for no apparent reason, it is really reasonable in a way that we would begin to have some feelings within us that we can only satisfy through fulfilling these motives in our life. Obviously, if you're in that position, on a spherical piece of matter, spinning through space at a thousand miles an hour, you certainly have a great sense of insecurity. (laughs) If you don't get dizzy. But you certainly begin to wonder, why? Why on earth is this thing remaining in space like this? And even though we don't talk about it every morning we get up, yet there is a tremendous sense of insecurity among us just because of our physical uh, position. And of course, many of us feel, well, all I can do is try to make myself as secure as possible. And the most obvious way to make ourselves secure is this old body. So we think, well, we'll fill the old stomach with food and we'll clothe the old body with clothing so that we keep it away from the rain and the cold and kind of protect it from other animals around us and we'll build little roofs over our head to keep us out of the storm and the thunder clouds. And so we end up dedicating ourselves to gathering food, shelter and clothing around us to give us a little bit of security. And of course that's the whole profit motive. And we've so often said that many of us in our jobs don't get above that at all. That's what governs our whole being. That's why we go to work each day. And then you can see, too, that there does come to you a tremendous sense of insignificance. When you realize that you're one of almost four billion little flies on this planet, you begin to think, oh, I have to in some way get my head above the crowd, and in some way I have to grow stronger wings than all the, all the other little flies, or I have to fly faster than all the other flies, but I have to do something to make myself significant. I feel so insignificant in this place. And so, of course, we're led into 
the whole desire to make ourselves significant somehow. And most of us, of course, try to do it by entering into that second motive. We try to exercise power over other people in some way to make ourselves a little more important than the others. I don't know if you still, any of you, still would support old Richard, you know. I think we pray for him, but I don't know that there are too many of us maybe who are still avid supporters. But we do sense that what he was doing and what Nixon was aiming at in his own life was, I'm afraid, what many of us are involved in. We really are power hungry and we're trying in some way to use power to establish some significance for ourselves. And the the third motive is easy. It's easy to see how it comes. It's very simple for us to begin to feel that this situation that we're in on the universe is very temporary. And we'd better grab as much of life as we can as it goes past. And so we become preoccupied with trying to enjoy ourselves, trying to get some kind of success, trying to prove to ourselves that life was a success after all. And so we're driven by the old success motive. And I think we shared that last day, that that's the way most people live in our universe. However sophisticated they are about it, however refined they are in covering it up, when it gets down to the nitty-gritty, what governs them is the desire for either profit or power or success. And those of you who were in, have, are in medical school know how tricky it is to know whether we're doing it for the good of humanity or whether there are other reasons for doing it. And I think all of us have faced that same kind of problem when we decide whether we're going to teach or nurse or whether we're going to go into business. It's these old profit, power, success drives within us that seem to take away freedom from us. The whole thing changes dramatically. If the creator of the universe is really the father of Jesus. The whole thing changes completely. If the creator of the whole universe is really the father of Jesus and really knows you and me and knows why he put us here, then, of course, all those motives are unnecessary. Especially if we can actually become related to the Creator. I mean, it's one thing to look up at a distant Creator somewhere up there who doesn't know you and think, well, I'd better make my own plans because I'm not sure what he's thinking. But it's a different thing if this Creator actually wants you as his own son or actually wants you as his own daughter and is really prepared to infuse into you the uncreated life of his own son so that you become his own child, then suddenly you can begin to see that even your dad, and he's not nearly as good as God, but your dad feels a great responsibility for you, so does your mum. And so if this creator is really prepared to make us his own sons and daughters by giving us the spirit of his only begotten son, then obviously he's going to feel responsibility for us. We're not on our own. Do you remember that's as far, I think, as we got last day? Because, well, would you look at it, loved ones? It's Romans 8 and 17, and this is one of those verses that take about three weeks to finish, but you remember we started it last day, Romans 8 and 17, and it's page 983. 983. And that's the hypothetical statement then that, that follows. And if children, if we're his children, if he's prepared to regard us as his own children, then we're his heirs. We're heirs of God. Remember we shared that last day, that it's heirs in the sense of the Greek word kleronomoi, which means Not just heirs who will inherit when God dies because he's never going to die. But the word means sharers, possessors, people who enter into the possessions that he has effortlessly. 
And that's what we saw last day, that all the things that we go after in our motives of profit, power, and success, we're going to be heirs to effortlessly after this life is over. Do you remember how God put it in those verses? Well, maybe we should look at them, loved ones, because some of us won't have been here last day. Matthew 19 and 29. Matthew 19 and 29. It's page 854, the ones, 854, and Matthew 19 and 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Creator is kind of saying to us this morning, look, would you stop wearing yourself out on that miserable mortgage? Would you stop wearing yourself out trying to get a good job so that you'll be able to buy a few more acres? I'm going to give you hundreds of those when this life is over. Now, would you just be satisfied and enjoy the ride? And we're still saying, no, 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 we can't enjoy the ride. I have to hold tight and... I have to get in as much as I can. And really, you know, we're like the old boys in Vegas, you know, kind of pull it in. (laughs) And the father is saying, believe me, you're my heirs. I will give you a hundred times the brothers and the sisters and the houses and the families that you're prepared to let go of. I'll give you a hundred times that amount. And of course, he says one, there's one condition. If you'll only let the spirit that governed my son Jesus, the spirit that is prepared to give and is prepared to stop trying to grab for itself, if you let that spirit come into you, then I'll give you all these things, believe me. Loved ones, do you see that's part of the reason why it is impossible for you to be totally satisfied with a miserable quarter of an acre. Because you were made to inherit hundreds of thousands of acres throughout the universe. Part of it is we're selfish. But part of it is that when you look at that miserable little house that you've eventually got together after 50 years of struggling, and then it burns up. (laughs) Or you find that it's ready for about $100,000 worth of repairs. The sinking feeling that you have at that moment comes because you were not meant to try to satisfy those desires by grabbing for yourself. You were meant to allow the Spirit of Jesus who forgets himself and who is prepared and concerned to give to others rather than himself, you were meant to let that spirit come into you so that God would give you hundreds of thousands of families and brothers and sisters and homes and lands. And so it is impossible for us to be satisfied with a little acre or with a little house or a duplex. We're just trying to satisfy something that can only be satisfied by infinite things that God will give us. You know, it's the same with the other things. You remember Matthew 5 and verse 5. It explains a wee bit about people like Onassis and and old de Gaulle here. Matthew 5 and 5. And us ourselves. Page 838. Matthew 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The Father says, look, if you let the Spirit of my Son come into you, Spirit of gentleness and meekness, Spirit that doesn't want always its own way, then I tell you, you're going to be the people who will inherit the whole earth. And you, in fact, will rule over the whole earth. And loved ones, that's true. 
The 70 years is not the final purpose. The 70 years is a place where he makes us fit and able to begin to bring the whole universe under his control. And that's why he says, if you allow the spirit of my son's meekness to come into your life and take it over, if you stop demanding your own way in every situation, then I tell you, I'm going to give you the earth to rule and to exercise authority over loved ones. That's why an Onassis or a de Gaulle or you or me are always frustrated however much power we manage to get to ourselves. It is never enough. We're never satisfied with it. We always want more. Oh, you remember someone said about Nixon, uh, if he was elected for life, he'd run again. You know. <laughs> and, and that's it. That's it. That's us. You know it. You know it. If we were elected for life, we'd run again. Because it seems we always want more power. We always want to exercise more authority. We always seem to have to prove ourselves just once more. And the Father says, look, if you'd give that up, it's not the Brezhnev's, it's not the Mao's that are going to inherit the earth. It's you who allow the spirit of my only begotten Son to come into you in meekness and gentleness. To you, my children, I will give you the earth to rule over. Meanwhile, be content even if you can't rule everything the way you want. It's the same, you know, with that Matthew 25, if you look at it, because it doesn't only deal with that profit, you know, and, and, and power motive, where we want all the lands we can get, or we want all the houses we can get, or we want all the authority or power we can get, but... It applies to this business of success. Matthew 25 and verses 34 through 35. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. And God is saying, I'll give you all the success that you want after you come to be with me. I'll give you all the love and all the excitement and exhilaration that you could hope for. That's why, loved ones, we're often involved in demanding more love from our dear wife than she is capable of giving. That's why we're often demanding more love and affection from our children than they're capable of giving, because we were made for a supernatural excitement and exhilaration that only God is able to give us. Loved ones, it doesn't matter how fast you take uh, a Harley Davidson round a corner, it is nothing like skidding round Jupiter. And that's really what God is saying. That there's an exhilaration and there's an excitement and there's a fulfillment of love and of emotional life that can only be satisfied with what I have for you after this life is over if you are prepared to die with my son to the need of those things now in this present life, if you are prepared to stop being those who want to be fed, who want to be made happy, and if you will become those who give to strangers and who will concentrate on giving joy to others, then I will give you all the joy and success and exhilaration that you need after this life is over. And loved ones, that's, I think, as far as we got last day. But isn't that pie in the sky when you die? I mean, isn't that the old story, you know? Well, it's not so good now, but it'll be better next time around. So just suffer now, and at the end, God will give you heaven and everything you want. Is that not what it means to be an heir? 
And I think a number of us probably would answer, well, yeah, I, I suppose that is what it means because we can see you're saying all this will come to us after we have died and we can't enter into our inheritance until we have died. So I can kind of see that, yeah, I, I suppose we won't get those until after death. But, loved ones, there is somebody who has already died and has already entered into those things. There is God's original only begotten Son. And if you think of it for a minute, He's already died. And so He has already entered into His inheritance. And He's entered into all these things. In other words, at this moment, he's resting in the middle of the planets. And he knows he's having conversation and fellowship with old Thomas Akempis and St. Francis, with Luther, with Augustine. He's having all the fellowship that he could want because he's experiencing the immediate sense of love that comes from his father. He has a great sense of approval from his father at this moment. He knows his father accepts him utterly and completely. He experiences all the exhilaration of his father's love. And he looks out on an infinity of a universe over which he has full authority. So Jesus has already entered into all those things. Now let me show you how we benefit from that. John 16 and 14. John 16 and 14. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, you remember. It's page 940. John 16 and 14. He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Greek word means share it with you. For he will take what is mine and share it with you. In other words, for any of us here this morning who are prepared to let the Spirit of Jesus rule and control our lives, that same dear Holy Spirit will take all the benefits that Jesus has in his inheritance at the present time and he will make them real in your own life. He will make them real inside you. That's what it means. The Holy Spirit is able to give you the same feelings that Jesus has, even though you and I have not entered into our inheritance. We are able to experience the same feelings as Jesus himself has. That's why we come to that next phrase. And maybe you'd look at it in Romans 8 and 17b. Romans 8 and 17b. It's page 983. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. That's something we have not entered into yet, our inheritance as heirs of God. And fellow heirs with Christ. In other words, we are able to experience inside in our own emotional and spiritual and mental lives all the feelings and attitudes that Jesus has himself now that he has entered into his inheritance. Loved ones, the Holy Spirit is able to make real in you the feelings that Jesus has at this moment. So at this moment, Jesus looks out on planets that you and I cannot see. He looks out on space that we have no idea exists. And he has a tremendous sense of being a million, billion, billion heir. Now, loved ones, if you are willing to let Jesus' spirit of unselfishness and of forgetfulness of your possessions 
If you are willing to die to your preoccupation with getting the old food, shelter, and clothing that you need, then that Spirit of Jesus is able to impart to you the attitude of a millionaire. Now, that's right. Now, you can produce it yourself. You can listen to me describing it, and you can say, oh, let me juggle those thoughts a few more times to see if I feel that way. Loved ones, it isn't something you create by your own mental gymnastics. It is a miracle of God's Holy Spirit. He is able to give you the same feeling of confidence in the midst of emptiness, in the midst of even poverty. He is able to give you the same sense of confidence that the son of a billionaire would have. He is able to give to you the feelings of contentment that Jesus himself has as he looks out on all that he possesses. He is really able to make you like the early apostles. And it's said that they possessed nothing, yet you'd think they owned everything. And then once the Holy Spirit is able to do that. He's able to give you, if you're willing to stop being preoccupied with the food and the shelter and the clothing, he's able to give you enough to get you by, but he's able to give you the sense of security that he himself possesses at this moment and the sense of contentment. See, I think a lot of us say, oh, well, I mean, I'm prepared to give things up, I'm prepared to give them up, but what would I feel like inside, loved ones, the Holy Spirit? gives you the feelings of a millionaire. He gives you a sense of knowing that the daily bread will come each day. No more watching the old IBM stocks to make sure they stay up or going for the 3M shares and making sure they're staying up. No more worrying whether your investments will survive the recession or not but at last a sense that your destiny is in the hands of the person who owns all the shares in the world. And the Holy Spirit is able to give you that sense, even in the midst of poverty and in the midst of lack. So many dear ones have lived as rich millionaires, and yet they've owned nothing. George Mueller never had a sense of being anything but the son of the king. He knew that he could get everything he needed. And you remember how he built oh, hundreds of orphanages through what his father gave him. And yet he himself had very little in his pockets from day to day. Now, loved ones, if you're prepared to let the spirit of Jesus' death to this prophet motive come into your life and rule it, then the Holy Spirit is able to give you the same sense of confidence that Jesus himself has. Have you ever... I'll show you a verse. Matthew 6 and 28. Have you ever tried to psych yourself into this verse? Matthew 6 and 28. Some of you obviously have. You remember the verse. Matthew 6 and 28. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. I think a lot of us take that old verse and we say, yeah, consider the lilies of the field. Consider the lilies of the field. Yeah, the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they reap. Now, remember, they toil not, neither do they And yet, so, yeah, and... It's hopeless. You can't psych yourself into it, can you? You can't. I mean, you do your best. You try to memorize it. You try to put it up on your wall. You write it down in the back of your bank book. And you, <laughs> you, you try to keep persuading yourself, I believe it, I believe it. Yes, no, well, yes, I believe it. And at the end of each month, you kind of aren't sure. And then halfway through the month, yeah, I believe it. But as the month comes to an end, you're not sure whether you believe it. Loved ones, you can't psych yourself into that. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. When you allow the Spirit of Jesus to come into you and die finally to it being your responsibility to get all the food, shelter and clothing you need. When you at last are prepared to join Jesus on the cross and die to being 
in control of all your own possessions, then the Holy Spirit is able to make that verse real in you miraculously and is able to give you a sense of detachment from your possessions and is able to make you sit loosely by your possessions. But loved ones, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit working in you if you fulfill the condition of letting him come in and die with Jesus to this food, shelter, clothing motive in your life. Loved ones, it it really is that. When you take the step of faith, the Holy Spirit begets in you this grace. And you know how often somebody has asked you, do you believe that God will provide every need of yours from his riches and glory in Christ Jesus? And you say, well, yeah, but sometimes my faith is weak, you know. Well, it's bluff, you know. Your, your faith isn't there at all. You're just trying to believe it intellectually. And loved ones, only when you allow the Spirit of Jesus' only begotten Son to come in and rule your life and control your life, only then will you begin to sense within that feeling that my Father is the King of the universe. He will provide bread for me each day, daily bread as I need it. He will provide for me from his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's a fruit of the Spirit within you, you see. And that fruit is begotten the moment you begin to allow the Holy Spirit to govern you. If you want to know what that means. That means, uh, oh, well, I'll tell you a horrible experience I had. It was my first experience of uh, letting my wife follow the Spirit. Uh, Brothers, be very careful of doing it. We had, a, we had a, a gentleman from the West Coast who was speaking in the Methodist church that I preached in in North Minneapolis. I've told some of you about it. And he said, um, uh, now, when the, it comes offering time, just do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Well, I have never been as rash as that in my own life, and I certainly wouldn't be as rash as that with my wife's life. But I was sitting in the pulpit with him, And then I felt, and I realized that she had the checkbook. And uh, I just said, well, Lord, I'd better just leave it to you. And uh, I think then she was moved to put $50 in that uh, day. And that was our first breakthrough. When we started to let the Holy Spirit govern our attitude to our material positions. That's what I mean by giving it over to him, you see. It's when it comes to a moment like that, saying, Holy Spirit... What do you want me to do? It's when it comes to the moment when you're about to buy the bike or you're about to buy the coat or the Davenport. It's at that moment saying, Holy Spirit, what do you, dear Spirit of Jesus, what do you want to do at this moment? That's what I mean by letting him control your life. Then as you do that day by day, the Holy Spirit will begin to beget in you an absolute sense of security even though you have nothing, even though you may possess nothing. He'll give you a great sense that you own everything that Jesus owns and that whatever you need tomorrow, he'll provide for you. Now that's, loved ones, part of the way in which we're co-heirs with Christ. It applies to power, you know, exercising authority. Jesus at this moment exercises authority over every proton and neutron. Loved ones, that's why we all stay together. If Jesus were to lift his little finger at this moment, we would blast apart. We would explode. It is because Jesus is at this moment controlling the whole world of nature that we stay together at this moment. It is because he is holding your body together by invisible powers, that you stay together at all. It is because he holds the pressures of the universe right. It is because he controls the orbits of the planets that we are able to continue to exist. Now, Jesus, therefore, exercises tremendous authority throughout the universe. Now, if you will die to making your wife do what you want her to do, if you will die to insisting that everybody in your office does what you want when you want it. 
If you will die to insisting that your children not only obey you, but just become the kind of person that you are, if you will die to that, the Holy Spirit will impart to you the sense that Jesus has of tremendous authority. And you will realize a conviction within you that God is going to work all the events in your life according to the counsel of his will. And you'll sit there in a situation where things are all blasting apart. And you'll want so much to wrest it out of their control and to get it back under your own. And there'll come this tremendous conviction within you. But God is in charge of this thing. He is working everything according to the counsel of his will. The Holy Spirit will impart to you a tremendous certainty and assurance from Jesus that the angels are already on their way to deal with the situation. If, loved ones, you will let the Holy Spirit impart to you the meekness and the gentleness of Jesus. Now, you don't have to be a school teacher to know what we're talking about there. You who are school teachers know it. You begin to see the class getting out of control and you feel you're the only one. And so the temper goes, or the righteous indignation, we call it, goes. And we try to haul them back. Every mum knows it in the situation in the home. Every dad, when you see she spent a dollar too much or five dollars too much, you want to bring it under control. Loved ones, if you will join Jesus on the cross, when the Roman soldiers were destroying him, and he knew with one finger he could destroy them, if you will die to your right to have your way in every situation and to control everything the way you want it, if you will let the Holy Spirit beget in you the meekness and the gentleness of Jesus, then the Holy Spirit will give to you a quiet sense that there are other powers at work bringing the situation under God's control. And you'll begin to find that situations in your life come into order. That's what I find. I find it in school teaching and in finance situations where just a hair trigger, you know the way we act on a hair trigger. See the thing going the wrong way and we're out after it. And we just mess up the thing worse. If you will die to that right to control it the way you want it and let the Spirit of Jesus come into you in meekness, then the Holy Spirit will give you the sense that Jesus has of limitless authority. And you'll have a quiet sense. You'll sit there and somebody will say, why aren't you doing something? Why aren't you doing something? And you'll hardly know. You'll just sense, no. God is in control of this thing. And the angels are already on their way to deal with it. And I'll rest. And then the Holy Spirit will tell you when you have to move. Because at times you have to make some moves. But it won't be that old panic move to get the thing back under your control. Now, loved ones, if you say to me, Oh, you mean it is pie in the sky when you die? You enter into all that inheritance when we die? No, loved ones. We are co-heirs with Jesus. You can enter into these things now. Because the truth is this. It's not the land or the house that gives you security. Sure, it's not. Finally, is that true? You remember the security you felt when you were with your dad in his arms going up the stairs to bed? You didn't own a house then. You didn't own a car. You didn't have a big bank book then. It's not the houses or the land that gives you a sense of security. It's knowing that you're in the hands of someone who has everything available that you need and will give it to you as you need it. Now that conviction is a fruit of God's Holy Spirit. And that fruit comes if you let the Spirit of Jesus come into your life. And you can do it even this morning. You can say, Father, I've lived for profit, power, success all my life. And I'm worn out doing it. And I still haven't secured it. Lord Jesus, I want your spirit to come into my life. And when these issues come up, I'm prepared to follow you. And Holy Spirit, will you give me what I'm trying to find? with all these other ulterior motives. And loved ones, it really does work. It really does work. You are not only God's children, 
but you're his heirs and you're co-heirs with Jesus. That's why they call the Spirit the guarantee of our inheritance. Because he gives us the feelings that we're going to have when we eventually enter into our actual inheritance. He gives us the conviction that we can have whatever of Jesus' inheritance we need at this time. So I'd ask you, you know, to oh, think about it and pray about it. The, the old recession is bottoming out, isn't it? And I suppose the employment thing will improve in about a year's time. And So really, in a sense, we're still in a beautiful, opportune situation to deal with this issue. It won't be long before we're wealthy again. And we don't need it. You know. And now is a good time to deal with God about Oh, your position with him. Let's pray.